Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are on listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, press star, followed by the number one. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I'd now like to introduce Irene Ahir. Ma'am, you may begin. Hello, and welcome to today's SBA webinar. I am Irene Ahir of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. On December 28, 2016, the SBA issued the final guidance document on post-market management of cybersecurity in medical devices. This guidance document is intended to inform industry of agencies' recommendations for managing post-market cybersecurity vulnerabilities for marketed and distributed medical devices. The focus of today's webinar is to share information and answer questions about the final guidance document. Today's presenters are Dr. Suzanne Schwartz, Associate Director for Sciences and Strategic Partnerships, and Dr. Seth Carmody, Cybersecurity Project Manager in the Office of the Center Director here in CDRA. Following the presentation, we will open the line for your questions related to topics in the final guidance only. Additionally, members of the cybersecurity team will be made available to assist with the Q&A portion of our webinar. Now, I give you Suzanne. Good afternoon and Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to FDA's webinar on the post-market management of cybersecurity and medical devices. My name is Suzanne Schwartz. I'm the Associate Director for Science and Strategic Partnerships at FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. With me today is Dr. Seth Carmody, our Center's Senior Program Manager for Medical Device Cybersecurity. We are also joined by Dr. Dale Nordenberg of MDIS and Denise Anderson of the NHISAC, who will contribute to this webinar presentation by providing a high-level overview of the collaborative vulnerability and threat information sharing functions of the MDIS NHISAC initiative. On December 28, 2016, FDA released its final guidance on the original draft by the same name that was issued last January. During today's webinar, we will address the changes to the draft that resulted from the responses we received during the public comments period. We will walk through the policy using examples and allow time at the end for Q&A. We want to take this opportunity to thank all of the stakeholders in the medical device ecosystem for the constructive and collective feedback, which we believe further strengthens the framework and approach articulated. Bottom line up front, Addressing medical device cybersecurity means implementing a proactive, comprehensive risk management program that incorporates these key tenets. Applying in this framework to strengthen critical infrastructure cybersecurity, establishing and communicating processes for vulnerability intake and handling, adopting a coordinated disclosure policy and practice, deploying mitigations that address cybersecurity risk early and prior to exploitation, and very important, engaging in collaborative information sharing for cyber vulnerabilities and threats. For today's webinar, we'll begin by contextualizing medical device cybersecurity within the broader healthcare and public health sector of critical infrastructure. FDA's approach is grounded in the total product lifecycle framework, driving towards an ethos of continuous quality improvement. As a community, it's essential that we maintain a holistic end-to-end -end view of medical device security from its initial stages of design through its use lifespan until it is obsolete. Anything less than that would misalign with the nature and the very landscape of security of the Internet of Things, where vulnerabilities evolve and new threats emerge demanding continuous vigilance. We will identify what has changed from draft to final. We will then go over key terms that are introduced into the guidance. Following that, we'll do a walkthrough of the cybersecurity risk assessment explaining how FDA policy leverages the use of the information sharing and analysis, otherwise known as an ISAL function, 
providing an overview of controlled and uncontrolled vulnerabilities with examples. Dale Nordenberg will then speak about the initiative that MDIS, working in partnership with NHISAC, has stood up for medical device vulnerability and threat information sharing. And finally, before we open up the webinar for questions, we'll wrap up with key messages, the foundational elements that should be incorporated in a comprehensive medical device cybersecurity management program. Healthcare and public health is one of the 16 sectors of critical infrastructure and represents a significant attack surface today for our nation. It's considered to be a soft target. Intrusions and breaches occur through weaknesses in the system architecture. Healthcare delivery organizations are constantly sending off attempts at intrusion into their systems. These can be of varying motivations. Connected medical devices, like all other computer systems, are vulnerable to threats. And it's worth noting here that even if the device is not connected, but it possesses software, that device may be vulnerable. Security vulnerabilities can directly impact medical devices or hospital network operations. And when medical device vulnerabilities are not addressed and remediated, they can serve as points of entry into hospital and healthcare networks. This can lead to compromise of data confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Worse yet, it can introduce safety concerns for the patients who rely on the safe and effective use of their devices, whether in the hospital, at the bedside, at home, or implanted. Let's take a few moments to step back and contextualize FDA's policy and approach to medical device cybersecurity within the broader national architecture. In February 2013, the President issued Executive Order 13636. And I highlight for you a key statement from that order that in essence encapsulates the direction that our agency has taken. We can achieve these goals through a partnership with the owners and operators of critical infrastructure to improve cybersecurity information sharing and collaboratively develop and implement risk-based standards. For us at FDA, this statement incorporates some very critical concepts worth underscoring. Partnership of owners and operators, information sharing, collaboration, and implementation of risk-based standards. Our approach has been one of fostering collaboration, engaging the many diverse stakeholders within this ecosystem, recognizing that we'll only make progress when the whole community takes ownership and responsibility, harnessing all of our collective efforts to improve medical device and healthcare cybersecurity. It was this executive order in February 2013 that further directed the creation of the NIST framework for critical infrastructure cybersecurity, with Department of Homeland Security charged with spearheading its adoption across all sectors of critical infrastructure. To further deploy the concept of information sharing for cybersecurity, another executive order was issued in February 2015, and that called for the establishment of information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISAOs for short. Efforts have been ongoing across the U.S. to further characterize what an ISAO would be, how it would work, and what protections it would afford. With this background, FDA has taken a multi-pronged approach to medical device cybersecurity. In the broadest of strokes, and as depicted on this slide, it is characterized by three C's. Coordination with our federal partners, collaboration across both public and private sector with a targeted focus on stakeholder groups that are new to the healthcare space, and communication to the public at large through several mechanisms, safety communications, convening of public workshops, and articulating our policy through written guidance as well as through outreach. 
Our approach to medical device cybersecurity, as I mentioned earlier, is a total product lifecycle approach from the earliest of design and development stages out to obsolescence. Therefore, in June 2013, we issued pre-market guidance and draft finalized in 2014. The key principles, number one, shared responsibility between stakeholders. Number two, address cybersecurity during the design and development of the medical device. And third, the importance of establishing design input for device related to cybersecurity. Because vulnerabilities will continue to evolve, Pre-market controls alone are not sufficient to manage cybersecurity of devices through their lifespan. We have therefore put forward policy for managing the cybersecurity of devices in distribution. The key principles are, number one, use a risk-based framework to assure that risks to public health are addressed in a continual and timely fashion. Secondly, we articulate the manufacturer's responsibilities by leveraging existing quality system regulation and FDA's post-market authorities. Third, to continue to foster a collaborative and coordinated approach to information sharing and risk assessment. And fourth, to maintain that close alignment with the executive orders and this framework. So what's changed from the draft to final guidance? The initially proposed 30-day remediation time frame has now been expanded to include a 60-day tiered approach. To more closely align with current FDA-recognized standards so that the community, the ecosystem at large, are all using the same lexicon, Essential clinical performance is now safety and essential performance, specifically scope to patient harm, and you'll hear more about that in later slides. We received many questions about ISAOs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. In the final guidance, we clarify the definition of active participation by providing specific criteria. And finally, the scope of the guidance has been further clarified with respect to privacy as well as confidentiality harms. I'd like to turn this over now to Dr. Seth Carmody, who will walk us through the meat of the guidance. Thank you, Suzanne. This is Seth Carmody. I'm the Senior Program Manager for Medical Device Cybersecurity at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. The background provided by Dr. Suzanne Schwartz, we are well positioned to dig into the guidance policy. In principle, the final guidance is cybersecurity risk management. The guidance provides a suggested risk management framework and a separate methodology with which manufacturers can use to meet their regulatory obligations under 21 CFR 820. The assessment methodology combines concepts from the FDA-recognized standard ISO 14971 and the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, known as CVSS. Combining the concepts provided in ISO 14971 and CVSS provides medical device manufacturers with a repeatable methodology for assessing risk of patient harm due to vulnerabilities. Within medical devices and accessories, while ultimately providing a triage tool for the prioritization of remediation, as well as cybersecurity routine updates and patches. Now that we've introduced the key risk assessment methodology, let's get acquainted with a few key terms. The terms safety and essential performance are derived from the FDA's definition of safety and the International Electrotechnical Commission's definition of essential performance. The FDA's intent and use of the terms is twofold. One, to align with current FDA regulatory jurisdiction and existing definitions, and two, to articulate when manufacturers should be concerned about the impact of a potential exploit on a device's functionality. The utility of the term safety is the key medical device manufacturers in on the functionality of a device which must remain authentic, integral, and evaluated. 
available for a device's safe and effective operation and delivery of the intended use. To further clarify with respect to existing FDA-recognized standard definitions, and particularly IEC's use of the term basic safety, FDA views basic safety as a subset of the FDA's definition of safety. Use of the term essential performance is in alignment with IEC 60601, 2012's definition of essential performance, and is synonymous with the intent of the draft guidance introduction of the term essential clinical performance. The utility of the term essential performance is to key medical device manufacturers in on the clinical functions of a device for loss or degradation due to an exploit would result in an unacceptable risk. The risk may be any number of business and organizational risks, including loss or degradation, that presents a risk of patient harm. The intent of the terms safety and essential performance are not intended to be mutually exclusive. The idea is that some vulnerabilities may create the potential for the compromise of the device functionality such that safety is compromised directly, while other vulnerabilities may affect functionality such that the compromise of safety is indirect and not readily apparent. Vulnerabilities that could potentially affect essential performance may or may not compromise the device such that safety is compromised, resulting in an unacceptable risk of patient harm. Manufacturers are responsible for defining the safety, critical functionality, and essential performance of the device. Another key term in the final guidance is patient harm. The intent of the introduction of patient harm is twofold. One, to align with existing FDA and FDA-recognized standard definitions, and two, to appropriately scope vulnerabilities with the potential to affect safety and essential performance to those that could impact patients only. As we'll discuss further, the assessment of risk of patient harm is key to determining the appropriate actions by medical device manufacturers, specifically when changes are made to reduce risk of patient harm. And we'll go into this in later slides. However, I wanted to introduce that changes to address uncontrolled risk of patient harm are controlled, are called remediation, and are considered corrections. Changes to devices to address controlled risk of patient harm would be considered as cybersecurity routine updates and patches. The risk matrix that you see is a visual representation of the proposed risk matrix with exploitability on the y-axis and severity of patient harm if exploited on the x-axis. Together, the assessment yields risk of patient harm. The manufacturer must assess whether the risk of patient harm is controlled or uncontrolled. With respect to the y-axis exploitability, the suggested approach is to use the common vulnerability scoring system We've proposed the use of CVS 3.0. However, we've received feedback that organizations may also be using 2.0 or both. The guidance proposes suggestions of tools that are security-centric so that manufacturers may adopt and adapt them for their use, and FDA is supportive of the use of tools that facilitate the fulfillment of device manufacturers' regulatory obligations under 21 CFR 820. CVSS is broken down into three main parts. Base scoring, temporal scoring, and modified base scoring. Base scoring seeks to establish a quantitative and repeatable scoring based on characteristics of the vulnerability and its potential to impact confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The base score does not take into account defenses or controls of an organization or product. When monitoring resources such as the National Vulnerability Database maintained by NIST, please note that the CBSS score, base score, may be the only information provided, which necessitates the medical device manufacturer conduct further analysis, including filling in the temporal score. The temporal score are risk factors that change over time, such as the availability of that exploit code. We recommend going to CVSS uh, 3.0 to, to explore that topic further. And, the modified, and moving to the modified base score, the modified base score takes into account defenses or controls of an organization or product and should be assessed by the manufacturer. With respect to the assessment of severity of patient harm on the x-axis, 
Manufacturers should already have processes and experience for assessing the severity of impact of, the, of device defects on patients. Shown here is a suggested approach from ISO 14971. Generally speaking, the severity of patient harm increases from minor and temporary and inconsequential to requiring medical inter intervention as well as death. While this is a suggested approach to fulfill the risk assessment regulatory obligation, the intent of the guidance is to align with current manufacturer processes. The terminology used by medical device manufacturers could be from already established risk assessment methodology. Now we're going to turn to a key concept in the final guidance regarding information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISAs, which I'll discuss briefly. We have the benefit of having Denise Anderson from the NHI SEC and Dr. Dale Nordenberg from MDIS who will be speaking to these concepts specifically. Information and analysis organizations are organizations that will serve ultimately to reduce risk by leveraging information from one organization to be used by another organization. While well, ISACs, or Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, have existed for some time, information, and share, information Sharing and Analysis Centers have traditionally been sector-specific. FDA has entered into a Memorandum of Understanding with NHISAC and MDIS. In the final guidance, the FDA has articulated the concept of active participation in an ISAC or actions of a manufacturer that meet the intent of the post-market policy, first and foremost is the emphasis on active participation. Active participation means that manufacturers have to share information and process shared information. FDA has purposefully called on ISAs and manufacturers to share and process vulnerability and threat information, as well as customer communication. FDA does not expect that this is the only information that is valuable to manufacturers in order to reduce risk, and therefore FDA is not trying to limit the types of information shared. Manufacturers should participate in ISOs that have defined governance structures, such as participant agreements, business processes, and operating procedures and privacy protection, such that the trusted environment is fostered. Now to an important flowchart and representation of the assessment and various assessment outcomes that can be described and are described in the post-market cybersecurity policy. First and foremost, the risk of patient harm must be assessed, and you can see the box in the upper left-hand corner. As discussed in earlier slides, the FDA has provided a suggested risk advantage framework and methodology based on the evaluation of exploitability and severity of patient harm should the vulnerability be exploited. Walking through the flow chart directly down, if there is no risk of patient harm, changes to devices are considered cybersecurity routine updates, patches, and, and aligned with current FDA guidance, uh, device enhancements versus recall. This is the same outcome for changes to device, if, you, if there is risk of patient harm, but that harm is, that, that risk is deemed to be a controlled risk. When changes are made to the device to address a controlled risk of patient harm, those changes are considered cybersecurity routine updates and patches. Again, well aligned with current FDA guidance, device enhancements versus recalls. In other words, for there to be no risk of patient harm means that an exploit could not itself allow a threat avenue to compromise the safety or essential performance of the device. In some cases, the assessment may determine that the vulnerability may present risk of patient harm, but the risk is mitigated by the presence of control. Such, the risk is reduced to an acceptable level. In general, the concept is that whatever, if there is risk, that it's controlled. In further articulation of the policy, when a risk of patient harm is present, and you can see on the top in the uncontrolled arrow, changes to reduce uncontrolled risk of patient harm would be considered corrections and removals, requiring adherence to 21 CFR 806. However, if manufacturers can meet three criteria, including 
One, there are no adverse events associated with a vulnerability. Two, corrections and changes to a device that reduce the risk within the provided time frame. These corrections, defined as remediation, must reduce the risk to an acceptable level. Three, they must meet the criteria for active participation in the ISAF. If all three criteria are met, then the reporting requirements under 806 would not be enforced. However, manufacturers would be required to document the correction within their quality system. Failure to correct the device when vulnerabilities present uncontrolled risk of patient harm could mean that the device is in violation of the act. As stated in the previous slide, in some cases, the assessment may determine that the vulnerability may present risk of patient harm, but that the risk of patient harm is mitigated by the presence of controls, such that the risk is reduced to an acceptable level. The FDA has provided manufacturers with the opportunity to strengthen their cybersecurity through enhancements and minimal oversight when risk of patient harm is controlled, including reduced post-market and pre-market burdens. For Class three devices, FDA has asked manufacturers to provide cybersecurity changes as part of the annual reporting requirement. As stated in previous slides, when a risk of patient harm is present, there are not controls, or controls present do not adequately mitigate risk and reduce risk to an acceptable level, then the risk of patient harm is considered uncontrolled. Changes to reduce uncontrolled risk of patient harm would typically be considered corrections or removals requiring adherence to 21 CFR 806. You can meet the, if manufacturers can meet the three criteria, again, including no adverse events, remediation of the vulnerability within the provided time frame, and we'll speak to those time frames specifically in subsequent slides, and meet the criteria for active participation in an ICE valve, and the reporting requirements of 806 would not be enforced. Manufacturers would be required to document the changes in their quality system. And it bears repeating that failure to correct a device when vulnerabilities are present represent uncontrolled risk of patient harm could mean that the device is in violation of the act. Having already discussed the criteria regarding adverse events and active participation in an ice out, I'd like to discuss the time frame for mitigating risk, including remediation. Recognizing that vulnerability assessments, risk assessments, and validated remediations can take longer than 30 days, the FDA expanded the time frame to a 30 and 60 day tier. FDA's intent for keeping the 30 day time frame is to encourage manufacturers to provide immediate risk reduction which could include communication to customers and users, as well as compensating controls, and most importantly, to develop a plan for further risk remediation. The 60-day timeframe was provided to give manufacturers sufficient time to validate their mitigations, which by definition includes more permanent risk reduction measures. These risk reduction measures must reduce the risk to an acceptable or controlled level. Within the 60-day time frame, remediation should be made to available to customers and given a reasonable time frame for the receipt and operationalization excuse me, for the remediation. It is expected that manufacturers will be continually updating their products and therefore need robust patch management capabilities, and these capabilities should increase over time. With regards to the customer communication, customer communication should, at minimum, describe the vulnerability, including an impact assessment based on the manufacturer's current understanding, state that manufacturer's efforts are underway to address the risk of patient harm as expeditiously as possible. Describe compensating controls, if any, and state that the manufacturer is working to fix the vulnerability, provide a defense and depth strategy to reduce the probability of exploit and or severity of harm, and will communicate regarding the availability of a fix in the future. FDA recognizes that not all vulnerabilities will be able to be completely remediated within the 60-day total time frame. FDA hopes that the policy serves 
to initialize and optimize manufacturers' batch management programs such that 60 day total time frame can be met. Moving on to guidance examples of controlled risk, vulnerability identification. Uh, control, uh, steps that may lead to walk through the, the controlled risk example, I'd like to step through a couple of uh, waypoints. First, vulnerability identification, then followed by vulnerability assessment and validation, impact analysis, risk determination, and then manufacturer action. Starting with vulnerability identification, for example, a researcher may publicly disclose an ex exploit code for a four-year-old vulnerability in commercial off-the-shelf database software. The vulnerable version of the software is in a percentage of the manufacturer's installed base and in two separate product lines, including a multi-analyte chemistry analyzer. In the assessment and validation process, the manufacturer determines that the vulnerability is the result of a misconfigured database setting and could allow an unauthorized user to view patient health information in the database. But the vulnerability does not permit the unauthorized user to edit or manipulate data in the database. Thus, the manufacturer determines the vulnerability has acceptable and controlled risk of patient harm. In the manufacturer's actions, they communicate and give appropriate mitigations in the communication. The manufacturer notifies its customers and the user community of the issue, details the secure configuration setting, and documents the effectiveness of the cybersecurity routine update for the configuration setting. In an example in the guidance of uncontrolled risk, we have a vulnerability known to the security community, yet may be baked into a class two device during development, unbeknownst to the manufacturer. During the identification, assessment, and validation uh, uh, process, in a post-market sense, the manufacturer becomes aware of the vulnerability and determines the device continues to meet its specifications, and that no device malfunctions or patient injuries have been reported. There is no evidence that the identified vulnerability has been exploited. It is determined that the vulnerability introduces a new failure mode to the device that impacts the central performance. So despite that there's no evidence in the field, the manufacturer determines that the essential performance is impacted. The manufacturer determines that the device design controls do not adequately reduce the risk of the impact of the essential performance and the risk of patient harm to an acceptable level. Therefore, without additional mitigation, the risk of patient harm is uncontrolled. The actions followed by the manufacturer in communicating an appropriate mitigation for this uncontrolled risk, the manufacturer does not have a fix immediately available to mitigate the vulnerability impact. Therefore, within 30 days of learning of the vulnerability, the manufacturer notifies its customers, the ISAL, and user community of the cybersecurity risk and instruct them to disconnect the device from the hospital network to prevent unauthorized access to the device. The company's risk assessment concludes that the risk of patient harm is now controlled with this additional mitigation. This connection of the device from the network is only a temporary measure, not a viable long-term solution, and may introduce new risks into clinical workflows. Therefore, Many, the manufacturer distributes a patch within 60 days of learning of the vulnerability in order to provide a longer-term solution. If the firm is an active participating member of an ISO, FDA does not intend to enforce the compliance with the reporting requirements under 21 CFR Part 806. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Dale Nordenberg from MDIS. And Denise Anderson from NHISEC. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of <clears throat> Denise Anderson from NHISEC, the president of NHISEC, and myself, we would like uh, very much to thank the FDA for the leadership that it has demonstrated as the stakeholders for medical device uh, and safe medical device operations have come together to address this large public health challenge. In addition, we've been for several years now working with other stakeholders, including manufacturers, healthcare systems, technology companies, 
and other government agencies, and it's been very impressive to see the community's active and <clears throat> deliberate response to this important public health challenge. We would like to cover today just a couple of slides that will give a high-level introduction to the medical device information sharing and analysis organization that will be operated by NHISAC and MDIS in a joint collaboration under the umbrella of the NHISAC, which is the healthcare sector-specific ISAL. The first slide <laughs> that we will review is a system description of the Vulnerability Information Sharing Initiative for the support of the FDA guidance. At a high level, there are a couple of key aspects of the system that we're going to go over. Uh, next week, February 9th, uh, January 19th, we will be doing an in-depth review of the um, Medical Device Information Sharing Analysis Organization function, and we will be posting the specifics for this webinar on both the NHISAC and the MDIS website. So the purpose of this initiative is to have a medical device vulnerability information sharing system. It would be based on the 21 CFR 806 reporting, and the reason this is being done is to make the reporting process very familiar to manufacturers. We recognize that the idea of sharing cybersecurity-related information is new, as well as the notion of having a medical device ISAO. So the premise was to try to create familiarity for both the process and the content. The web-based system will be available through the NHISAC.org website. The mission will be secure and via either an uploadable PDF file or an online form. The vulnerability will be shared by the manufacturer to the ISAO. If any other third party is interested in reporting a vulnerability, they will be referred to the manufacturer so that the manufacturer can evaluate the vulnerability and determine the appropriateness of reporting to the ISAO. All vulnerability information that, that is being shared to the ISAO will be the word we used on this slide deck is embargoed, and the idea here is that at launch of the ISO, we want to be very conservative about how that information is shared, and it will be shared with entities once the manufacturer has acknowledged that the sharing will occur, be that with the FDA, ICS, CERT, or any other entity. The next thing we'd like to review are some of the key attributes of the system. It's important for all of us to recognize that this is a service. This is a service to the medical device stakeholder community. It's a service that is designed to support the FDA guidance, and ultimately it's a service to support the public's health. It's been collaboratively developed. There have been many manufacturers, healthcare systems, and again, government agencies and other technology companies that have come together over well over a year to better understand what a vulnerability is and how to define them, how to evaluate them, and ultimately how to report them. We all recognize that this is a process that is constantly ongoing, undergoing evolution and that there is a, a good deal of maturation that's still required. And one of the key functions of the of this initiative, of the information sharing initiative, is to also provide a venue for key stakeholders to continue to do the required learning and to improve our, our best practices. We already mentioned the fact that it's been designed to be a familiar process. We will also work with other partners to ensure that there is more coordination and efficient coordination regarding the reporting of vulnerabilities. For example, when reporting to the ISAO, <clears throat> it, there will be attempts to make sure that we can interface with ICS CERT and the FDA and other entities in a way that a manufacturer, if it desires, can leverage this initiative to simplify and streamline reporting across these entities. 
the collecting and sharing of data is going to be based on public health best practices. This, again, is a large scale challenge, public health challenge, many healthcare systems, many, many different kinds of devices, large exposure to patients, so that we will be leveraging methodologies and, and practices that have been used for many other types of public health problems. Again, we've already mentioned that this is a service that's going to be service-driven. It will be based in, in scientific foundation and ultimately drive to have both safety, to ensure safety and privacy. In addition to providing the service and support of the FDA guidance, there are, are a couple of high-level outcomes we also wanted to mention. Number one is to improve the understanding of vulnerabilities in medical devices. Number two is to improve stakeholder communities' solution development around medical device vulnerabilities. Three is to support the harmonization of best practices for medical device security information sharing. And four is to improve the efficiency to market for medical devices while at the same time improving the security, safety, and privacy profiles for medical devices and their associated network. So as has been mentioned, the purpose of this short presentation was to give a high-level introduction to the medical device subsidiary stakeholder community. Meese Anderson and I look forward to having a webinar uh, next week, January 19th. Details to be posted on our websites. We're very happy to have the FDA participate in this webinar and a number of the key elements of the information sharing analysis function will be presented by stakeholders in our community from manufacturers, health systems, or other government agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dale. In summation, we'd like to emphasize the core principles for implementation of a proactive, comprehensive risk management program. Once more, to go through those, it's application of the NIST framework to strengthen critical infrastructure cybersecurity. Number two, establishing and communicating processes for vulnerability intake and handling. Third, adoption of a coordinated disclosure policy and practice. Fourth, to deploy mitigations that address the risk associated with cybersecurity vulnerabilities early and prior to exploitation, therefore prior to harm. And finally, to engage in collaborative information sharing for cyber vulnerabilities and threats. Thank you. We'll now take questions. And thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star followed by the number one. Please unmute your line and record your name clearly as prompted. To withdraw the question, it will be star followed by the number two. Again, with questions, please press star followed by the number one. One moment for the first question. Eric Decker, your line's open. You may ask a question. Hello, thank you, and thank you for this presentation. It was very helpful. Um, my name is Eric Decker. I'm with the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, in the operator, did we do? Yeah, Eric Decker, please press star one again. We happen to lose your line. In the meantime, can we go on to the next question? Yes, one moment. Thank you. James, your line's open. Thank you very much. I thought is a centralized source of product system weaknesses. Would, would we agree with that? That said, assuming the system is hacked, these weaknesses will now be clearly identified, providing hacker with at least some period of opportunity. The ISAO itself then becomes a cybersecurity risk entity. Uh, any comments to that? Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the question. This is Dale Nordenberg. The, the public health community has been collecting highly sensitive data and information for many years and has strived to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of that information if and when it, it should be shared, and it, it should be shared only in appropriate instances. The NHISAC, this, the ISO will be hosting its data on the NHISAC infrastructure. That infrastructure has been evaluated from a, a security perspective in a very rigorous manner. It will continue to undergo that type of evaluation as part of its normal operating procedures, and that should help to safeguard the information that you are referring to. So we take this very seriously, and I'd like to give Denise Anderson an opportunity to also respond to this question. Thank you, Dale. Um, thank you for your question. Yes, the ISACs themselves have been, you know, obviously have been full of information over the decades that they've been in existence, and that's always been a um, obviously a concern. But the ISACs have taken very good steps, and NHISAC, you know, being one of the ISACs, to protect the data that gets shared within their environment. We also take really big um, steps in what we call the traffic light protocol system, where everything is marked according to the originator's desire as far as how they want the information to be shared. In most cases, the information that comes through the ISAC are strips of any kind of attribution and PII. So that's another further level of protection. And anything that gets shared outside of the ISAC is also made anonymized. So we try to do as much as possible to, first of all, protect the data but second of all, to strip it with any and all attribution um, so that it is protected no matter whether or not it is um, distributed or accessed, which to, you know, to date, um, of course, has not happened. We'll take our next question. All right, thank you. Our next question is from Karen. Your line's open. Hi, I just have a couple of basic questions. So one is around um, timing for compliance. One is to ask you to repeat your um, website because I can't seem to find it. Um, so maybe we start with those two. Can you cl uh, this is Suzanne Schwartz from FDA. Can you clarify which website you're asking about? The I NFDA thought it website was the or the NHI the mdiss.nhisac.org. Right, so that that will become live at the time of the webinar next week. And okay. Any, any information about the webinar and that site will be posted on the nhisac.org and the mdiss.org website. Okay, perfect. I can I can at least find the NH, nhisac website. And then timeline, I understand the pre-market piece would be, you know, if you had a submission or made a change that required a submission. But with, res with respect to the post-market, um, a lot of this is new, joining an ISAO, et cetera. Is there um, a timeline? Is it immediate? Can anyone speak from FDA around compliance dates for the post-market? This is Suzanne Schwartz. That's a, that's a great question. The post-market guidance is for implementation at present. Uh, we do recognize that uh, there will be a learning curve associated with, first of all, you know, joining with an ISAO and understanding uh, the processes that are involved. But in terms of it going into effect with the release of the final guidance now being published, you can assume that uh, it is presently in effect. Okay. We we're providing various email addresses that you can address any specific questions to as they arise so that we can help our stakeholders with that process, because we recognize there's going to be uh, some uh, fix and starts associated with it at the beginning. Perfect. I'm sorry, one last question, and uh, forgive me, I haven't had a chance to really look at or speak with anyone about the ISO organizations. Based on your combined experience, like I'm, I'm in regulatory affairs quality, I have a scientific background, but not a software background. My company's small. 
recommendations for people that you think would be successful within a company, types of backgrounds for participating in that organization. Thoughts on that? Participating in the ISAL organization? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Like who, you know, is there, I realize there's probably no requirements, but were you to say the folks that are probably going to be the most knowledgeable with respect to understanding vocabulary and being able to be more effective um, participants, what types of backgrounds are you, are we looking towards our software engineers? Um, I realize it's not a requirement again, but just if you could give me some idea of the types of folks that might be most appropriate within an organization to be kind of that active participant within ISO. Thank, thank you very much. This is Dale Nordenberg, and I'll <clears throat> ask Denise to see if she has any, any follow-up comments. The nature of your question exposes a challenge that we recognize across the entire industry, which is, Cybersecurity and medical devices, device functions, and ultimately the evaluation of that function vis-a-vis -vis patient harm is really a multidisciplinary capability or expertise. And many companies have been going through a process of standing up cybersecurity-focused activities, bringing people in with that particular expertise, they're bringing together activities that had historically been siloed, the, the software development or device development R&D activities with the uh, cybersecurity and cybersecurity engineering activities and the regulatory activities. So it really depends on the specific company, how large your staff is, and how it's organized. So if, for example, you're a small company, and without getting into the details about exactly what that means, the expertise that would be required is a technical expertise, uh, cybersecurity expertise, and regulatory expertise. And one of the things we would recommend is you should feel free to reach out to the NHISAC and actually explore becoming a member of the NHISAC or a member of MDIS or other organizations that are already in the community and convening so that they can help organizations, companies like yourselves, understand how you need to mature, what kind of expertise you need to develop, and ultimately to uh, help you answer your question. Great. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our next question is from Dorik Gunn. Your line's open. Dorik, your line's open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for letting me ask the question. So I have two questions. Question one, what I hear from everyone, is essentially having a mature security or information security practice, including application and product security, can address this guidance. Am I right? And can you repeat the question? I didn't hear it in its entirety. Sure. Sorry about it. So if you have a mature information security practice, that includes technical, physical, and administrative controls, including application and product, does that capture every requirement from FDA guidance? Uh, this is uh, Seth Carmody. Um, I, I do understand the question. I, I don't, I couldn't say wholly without um, looking at your uh, organization processes and outputs in terms of what the a device or application might look like testing. So it's, it's hard to broadly say yes to your question, but I do understand. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you so much. The question was more at a high level. For instance, when NIST came up with the guidance on cybersecurity, uh, the gist of the matter is having a mature information security practice. And the reason I'm asking this question, the lady who asked this question in terms of what type of a stakeholder should be involved, Essentially, that is any stakeholder required to address information security, right? The point that uh, we are making here is that uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity with regard to maturity in the healthcare public health sector and specific to medical devices, and we recognize that uh, depending upon 
the size of the organization as well as, again, uh, the a degree of expertise within the organization in this particular area. So there is going to be variability organization to organization with regard to not merely the maturation uh, in this matter, but also who would be the appropriate representatives of that organization interfacing with the uh, ISAL function uh, with a uh, uh, being, you know, being a participant there. And to some extent that uh, to a great extent, that is going to be an organizational decision as to who is that appropriate or where does that appropriate expertise and representation reside within the entity. Um, but uh, as per the NIST framework, which provides the type of architecture for uh, maturation uh, starting with an organization that uh, is a lot less mature and moving out to more sophisticated organizations, we uh, realize and we apply the same principles with respect to the medical device industry also, uh, and that there is going to uh, be different steps incrementally that different organizations are going to need to take. That's why the focus really being on a mantra of continuous quality improvement and continuous maturation. The idea of participating in an ISAO as well is not merely about the vulnerability and threat information sharing. That is obviously a key principle or emphasis of the guidance and what we're doing here, but there is a lot more to say about it from the standpoint of best practices and shared learnings. Uh, by participating in a community in that manner. And that's perhaps something that Denise uh, can speak to, uh, Denise Anderson as the head of the NHI SAC. Certainly. Thanks, Suzanne. So the ISAC community is, is simply that, a community, a forum for sharing. And while we share information such as indicators of compromise, like IP addresses and, and various other technical components, we also share a number of best practices mitigation strategies, ask questions of each other like, hey, are you seeing this in your environment or how do you handle this? So it truly is a group of people helping each other um, with the issues that they face on a daily basis so that, you know, everyone can be more effectively secure in doing the right thing. Thanks for the information. And the last part of question, if I may ask. Okay. Uh, would the slides, presentation slides be available? We had issues uh, accessing that. Yes, they're currently available on CDRH Learn. So if you go to www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH Learn, they should be there now, and they're also on the webinar's webpage. Thank FDA. you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Our next question is from David Lerner. Your line's open. David Lerner, your line's open. Uh, yes. We're wondering about the uh, applicability of this uh, this guidance to software that's not specific uh, specifically part of the medical device, um, more along the lines of software that we use in the manufacturing of the medical device. One second while we get that answer for you. Can you repeat the question? We may need for you to elaborate a little bit further as well. Does this uh, does this guidance um, apply to only the software that's uh, a part of the medical device, or does it also apply to um, the software that we use for manufacturing or testing of the medical device during during the manufacturing process? No, the, the, it, if it applies to manufacturing software, it does not apply. Um, I would venture to say that the outcome or the output of a exploit in a manufacturing software would result in what, a, manufa a manufacturing defect, like a physical defect in the, the product. So no, we, we didn't, that is out of scope. Okay, also, thank just you. to add, uh, Mr. Lerner, I don't know if you've had a chance to actually take a look at the guidance yet. We do address that on uh, page eight of the guidance under scope, where we uh, call out specifically uh, what the guidance applies to. Okay, thank you very much. And if you have any further questions, uh, you can certainly direct them to Ask Med Cyber Workshop. 
at fda.hhs.gov for clarification purposes. And thank you. Our next question is from S. Lynch. Your line's open. Hi. I'm not sure I understand exactly what it means when we disclose a vulnerability to an ISAC and then say you can disclose it to the ISAC community. I guess the community is a bunch of joined members of the ISAC, but what if those members is somebody like Vladimir Putin Medical Devices Incorporated? How do you know that the members are acting in the interests of the group? So I'll take that one. Um, this is Denise Anderson with National Health ISAC. Um, we do um, take membership in the ISAC um, very seriously, and we vet all of the people that join the organization. There's a number of um, different processes that um, potential members have to go through, such as um, signing appropriate paperwork and, and all of the vetting that we do. So we, we do take that membership very seriously. And um, there also will be nuances in that the sharing through the ISAL um, sector will be a little bit more nuanced. Um, so you don't necessarily have to be an NHI tech member right now to be able to participate in the ISAL, um, although obviously, ideally, um, ISAC membership would be important. The other thing, and, and I don't know, Dale, if you want to speak to this a little bit more, that when something gets shared, it's, it's going to be shared in a very nuanced fashion, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you if, you if you want to comment that a little bit further. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> as we all move forward into a – as yet to be experienced domain of reporting cybersecurity information and reporting it to an entity organization that is just being stood up to support this new final guidance. The community of stakeholders is working very closely to understand how to do this in the most effective, productive, and secure manner. <clears throat> and to ensure the, if you will, the safety of the manufacturer that's doing the reporting. So as we launch this uh, activity, as we launch this reporting capability, as I mentioned, it's going to launch in a very conservative manner so we can all, <clears throat> excuse me, in a very studied manner understand how this works. There are many, many entities that are potentially involved and interested in the data. That's why um, the word embargoed was used, right, so that when the manufacturer supplies that information, as we launch, that information is not going any place until the manufacturer and the ISL has a discussion about what information goes where. And as we move forward after month one, month two, month three, and as we continue to get significant input from the manufacturing community, its related associations and uh, other entities will continue to evolve, evolve the way data is shared what is shared, when is shared, to whom is shared, how is it protected, how is it secured uh, as we move forward. So it's a great question. It's uh, very important, and we're looking forward to working with the community going forward. And so we, even if we keep – Hi, this is Suzanne Schwartz from FDA as well. I will add FDA perspective to that, and that the intent has never been to share actual exploit code or information that's highly technical around vulnerabilities. Uh, rather, it will have a lot more to do with the kinds of communications, in fact, that a manufacturer would be issuing to its customers. So uh, there is no intent towards providing information that's highly sensitive that would provide a roadmap towards being able to uh, take a vulnerability and use it uh, in a malicious manner. Do I also hear you saying, though, that even if we choose to keep a vulnerability embargoed, that's still considered active participation in the ISAC or ISO? So, as I mentioned, we're, we're using the, uh, the word embargoed in, in quotation marks. And so uh, what we're saying is that the community has to understand how to use this information and when to share it. So uh, the fact that it's being shared with the ISO is the first step, and then explicitly where it goes after that uh, – is, is going to be defined by the manufacturer. If the FDA says in order to be status, in order to satisfy reporting to the ISAO, the FDA has to have access, then it will be in the ISAO, but you will, if you don't permit us to share it with the FDA, then you will not have fulfilled the criteria of reporting. 
So I'll, I'll just, you know, hand this over to the FDA folks to say, to answer that very specific question about whether or not reporting to the ISAO but not giving FDA access to it would satisfy the requirements of reporting. Could they also tell whether access is fine-grained enough that we can enable FDA access but not general membership access? So, yes, that, that's absolutely the case. The other point okay. that I would add is that uh, as is the general process and procedure for reporting out of vulnerabilities for Department of Homeland Security, ICS CERT, that function will continue. And uh, at some stage, ICS CERT's involvement in coordinating that uh, assessment and what's often uh, an advisory uh, would be integrated into this process as well. But as you probably know, the ICS CERT advisories also, they do not contain information within them that would serve as a uh, blueprint or as a roadmap uh, for exploitation of a vulnerability. Thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Melody Tang. Your line's open. I believe it's Carter. Please unmute your line. Your line's open. Melody Tang. Carter. We'll take the next question, please. Our next question is from Heyman Young. Your line's open. Hi. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, essential, safety and essential uh, performance requirements. Um, from what was discussed in this webinar, that terminology is derived from 60601. Um, for, my question is like for devices uh, that are uh, IVDs that may not need to comply to 60601. Um, based on this uh, cybersecurity guidance, would the recommendation be to still have um, essential and safety performance defined so that we are able to uh, make an accurate assessment for cybersecurity uh, risks? This is Seth Carmody. Yes, excellent question. We, we fully recognize that in the scope of uh, 60601, if they specifically exclude IBDs, we're, we're applying the concept to IBDs. Um, so we're not excluding IBDs from the scope. Um, remember that safety and essential performance, again, is the key in clue in manufacturers to the risk, clinical risk that can manifest to the exploitation of vulnerabilities. So in IBDs, that's still present. It's just a terminology to help you frame uh, your risk assessment. Um, so it, if you are comfortable using it as an, uh, the concept and terminology as, as an IVD manufacturer, then we suggest that you use it. If you're comfortable using other terminology in your risk assessment, you feel free to do that. We're just ask, providing the risk assessment methodology and asking that if you don't use that, you need to use something else. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, may I ask another uh, unrelated question? Uh, it's regarding uh, the relationship, if there's any, uh, between exploitability and probability, which, uh, you know, probably is a, is a terminology that's uh, pretty familiar uh, for, for those who are familiar with uh, the ISO 14971 standard. Um, so kind of just want to see if you can uh, help um, provide some uh, examples of what may be related or what may not be related. Yes, uh, again, ex excellent question. So, and we did address this in the, in the, the document. Um, we know that, and from 14971, it explicitly states for software issues, defects, and sabotage, it is exceedingly difficult to calculate the probability of, say, exploitability. Um, if you, and that you assume that the, the probability of exploit is one, you assume failure. Uh, we recognize that. However, we didn't think that was very helpful for manufacturers and other stakeholders to triage uh, various vulnerabilities. So again, uh, if you're comfortable as an organization, your risk appetite is uh, sufficiently low or high, will determine 
you know, where you find uncontrolled and controlled level is for you to set. So if you feel um, that uh, that you're not you don't have good data or you don't feel comfortable around the parameters uh, characterization of the vulnerability and you feel like uh, your, your risk appetite is low, then you'll classify it as such. But we, we fully understand that calculating the probability is difficult, uh, but we did want to give people some parameters and characteristics that are used routinely in the security industry to assess vulnerabilities for triaging. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Mike. Your line's open. Yes, thank you. Um, our group here has a question. Uh, has the FDA been exposed to any medical device manufacturers who've already implemented cybersecurity measures uh, compliant to your standards? And if so, can you share some uh, samples on that implementation? Like, uh, for example, medical software housed on a computer? I, this is Dr. Carmody again. I was with you right until you gave the example. Um, yes, there are manufacturers that have adopted wholeheartedly the, the recommendations that have been put forth in the guidance. Um, uh, we do encourage collaboration, so um, there are forums that you can you know, belong to to share that type of information. And actually, I'm going to point to Dell and Nuremberg and Denise Anderson. Um, that's one of the functions of uh, ISPAL is to share best practices. Um, but uh, that's as far as uh, I'm comfortable sharing. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Wei Ping Zong, your line's open. Hello? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay. Um, I have a question regarding the reporting AO6 versus uh, report. Oh. We lost you. Hello? 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 Wei Ping, if you can star one again to ask your question. And we have Matt Shaw. His line's open. Well, oh, hi. Uh, this is Matt from Stephanie. So actually, my question is cybersecurity. I think similar to what Mike asked earlier, the previous question. So we, um, you know, in general, medical device industry, but uh, cybersecurity is applicable to many industries. Are we, uh, you know, it's good to have a community. Are we trying to you know, a way to leverage in different industries, for example, high tech, or even intelligence, uh, you, know, you know, part of government agency too. Is there a plan for us to, you know, for those folks to join us to help out our community? Uh, unfortunately, it was a bit difficult to understand your, your question. Uh, might you please repeat it again? All right. So what I was asking is that cyber security is applicable to not just medical device, but, you know, pretty much to all industry right now. And my question is, uh, you know, it's good for us to have a community we can share, we can, you know, solve problems together. Is there a way for us to accept the members, for example, from different industries? Like high tech, they have probably more mature solutions or or even intelligence agents, intelligence community. Uh, this is Dale Nordenberg. I'll, <clears throat> I'll take a first uh, pass at the question, and, and then maybe Denise Anderson can talk about the way the ISACs collaborate with each other across across industries. So it is it is possible for, uh, for example, within our organization, for other technology companies other than health system, uh, other than manufacturers or health systems uh, themselves to join. And so we do have a number of general technology companies and security companies that are participating with us, and, and we benefit from those perspectives. There are a number of venues, workshops, and other types of either symposia or or conferences, and we uh, <clears throat> and, and there are a number of multi-industry kind of stakeholders that attend those for the kind of cross-fertilization of expertise and ideation that you're referring to. NHISAC, in fact, has two conferences per year that um, includes not just medical devices but, but broad other types of expertise. So, uh, uh, And then from a government perspective, we clearly benefit from, from that as well. So, Denise, are you able to share some more detail? 
Um, sure, I could talk to the collaboration across the ISAC. So we collaborate um, actually with um, the 21 ISACs that are members of the National Council of ISACs, and we collaborate with each other on a daily basis. So we work very closely with each other on the threats that cross the sectors, including, of course, um, sectors that um, people that may not necessarily be part of the national health sector but are part of another ISAC, such as the finance or the um, IT sector. So we are working very closely with all of our um, constituents across the ISAC communities and share information with each other very robustly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Wei Ping Zhang. Sir, your line's open. Yes, this is Wei Ping. My question is about the AO6 reporting and the various the uh, sharing information of uh, ISIL, um before and after 60 days. Uh, my question really is about uh, original purpose, if I understand correctly, for the AO6. Part of the reason at least is for FDA to classify the recalls and post it on the um, public for public information. And then there are many implications after that. For instance, if it's class one, FDA may come and audit the company, inspect the company. So now with this criteria, 60 days, if it's reported to ISIL, and then the FDA's uh, other functions and disappears, is that the intention for that? So I, I don't think I understood it quite at the end of the question, but I, I do think I understand the intent here, so please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, reporting to the ISAO does not uh, absolve the manufacturer from, to, from giving that information and customer notification. So it's not that the public or the customers won't know uh, about the issue. Um, it's not that it will go to the ISAO only. It's going to your customers. And the intent of uh, not enforcing the reporting requirement to FDA under 806 is that uh, to facilitate the expediency of, of the fix so your customers know and that that customer notification or field correction action uh, letter, uh, you can focus on the fix as opposed to reporting uh, to the FDA. Does that answer your question? I, I think I understand part of that. Um, but uh, for a recall, if something is classified as a class two or class one recall, uh, they are more than, way more than just contacting the customers because you have to do a lot of follow-up actions, um, for instance, uh, uh, reconciliation. So the actions would be very different if, uh, depending on the severity of the uh, severity of harm you determine, right? So you may have different actions there. So I just wonder um, what would be FDA's uh, perspective if something just because one day difference, one is uh, following the recall process, the other one is not. What, what's the difference in there? So what I would say to you is that FDA takes into consideration multiple factors with regard to what subsequent activities or actions it might take. Uh, and uh, I think what you asked at the beginning of the question was, whether, you know, the idea of an audit or an inspection falls away as a result of using, uh, you know, the ISAO uh, function. And uh, what I would say to you is obviously this is, this is new, you know, this is new policy um, as, it, as it's evolving. Uh, but we're, we're separating out any piece with regard to what might be down the road inspections or audits. Uh, totally separate from uh, the concept of really trying to get, trying to move towards more expedient remediations and fixes and updates to really strengthen the uh, cybersecurity of devices in the post-market. Uh, and, and so let's just put aside the recall, the classification of a recall at this time or what other actions might occur, and let's focus primarily um, on uh, what we're doing here, which is uh, trying to remove impediments that might otherwise slow down the process towards getting uh, more secure devices in that are in the field making sure that they are uh, uh, properly being, you know, monitored and addressed from a security standpoint so that 
the risk towards patient harm is reduced. I just wanted to add on there that the, the, the difference between the time is the time. The time as time increases, we feel that the risk increases. That's why there's a temporal component to CDSS, uh, because we believe the overall risk increases with time. Therefore, we've emphasized expediency mm -hmm. and incentivized expediency. Yeah, it doesn't. It isn't to say that uh, inspections of firms won't occur, uh, and uh, you know, over the course of that firm's you know lifetime, um, where cybersecurity will be audited as well. So uh, that's a little outside the scope of this present guidance. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you once again. If there's further questions from the phone line, to please press star followed by the number one. Please ensure to unmute your line and record your name clearly as prompted. Again, if there's any further questions, star one from your touch tone phone. One moment for the next question. Caller, are you there? Prabhu, yes. your line's open. You may ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, my question was around uh, exploitability uh, scoring. Um, my takeaway from the presentation was that uh, base and temporal scoring is essentially a requirement, um, and my uncertainty was on the third part, which is environmental scoring. Is that a required portion to formulate the CVSS score? And uh, the second part of the question is, I wanted to know if what the schedule and time frame potentially is for um, uh, adapting the CVSS 3.0 to be more medical device uh, friendly in terms of how it's, the definitions are, are, are put out. Uh, good questions. I'll address the second one first. That, that is ongoing work uh, within the community right now in terms of adapting CVSS to uh, be more uh, medical device centric and um, uh, really drilling down to what confidentiality, integrity, and availability requirements mean uh, in terms of medical device communities. Uh, the, the, the first question that you asked, um, I, I hesitate to call it a requirement. We've, we've emphasized CVSS as a tool in order for you to assess risk. What I'm saying and what we've tried to delineate in the guidance is that uh, the base score and temporal score have parameters surrounding the vulnerability and the timeline of the vulnerability, which will help you to assess the risk. So from a requirement standpoint, I think it's a bit harsh, but we do recommend that you do assess those parameters. Um, the environmental uh, or modified, the results in the modified base score um, is what your defenses are. So you have the overall and, uh, aggregate risk and then assessment of the controls surrounding that uh, device or uh, device accessories. So as a requirement, it's, it's, I don't think that term fits, but in terms of assessing the entire, entirety of your risk, we recommend using CBSS in its entirety. Okay, thank you. And which entity would be primarily responsible for um, uh, adapting this CBSS 3.0 to the medical device domain further? And so FDA has been working with MITRE as a federally funded research center, SFRDC, uh, tasked with this effort, this initiative, and MITRE has convened uh, a stakeholder group uh, that has been working on the concept of translating or adapting the CVSS so it serves the medical uh, device and the clinical environment. Okay, if you would like further information about that, again, I'd recommend uh, writing to us at Ask Med Cyber Workshop at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you. And thank you. Our last question comes from Joanna. Ma'am, your line's open. Hi, good afternoon. My question is in regards to the scope um, as the guidance applies um, for mobile medical applications. Can you talk to whether the scope applies to medical um, applications that fall under enforcement discretion?
Hi, this is uh, Steph Parmody. I believe the uh, mobile medical applications that fall under enforcement discretion are still classified as medical devices. Therefore, the, the, those would be in scope. Okay, and thank you. And we recommend that uh, you apply cybersecurity principles to uh, not only medical devices, but other products you may have in your suite because it is a system of systems approach to security. Thank you. There is overlap with respect to taking a look at the uh, guidance that we published on mobile medical apps as well. So I would uh, recommend that you, you know, seek out that guidance for some further clarification. And also, if there's additional questions, please don't hesitate to write to us. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. And thank you. I would now like to turn the meeting back over to Irene Ahir. Ma'am, you may go ahead. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation and transcript will be made available on the CDRH Learn webpage at www.fda.gov forward slash training forward slash CDRH Learn by Monday, January 23rd. If you have additional questions about the final guidance document or, one, or were unable to ask your question today, please use the contact information provided at the end of this live presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for participating, and this concludes today's webinar. And thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time.